when I was reading uh, about Justice Judy Small's remarkable career, I kept being put in mind of those yarns, you know, a million of them which become, begin. Once upon a time there was an Englishman, an Irishman, and a Frenchman, or whatever. So once upon a time there was a psychologist, a folk singer, and a judge, and here she is. Well, well I should say a little more, I should say a little more. Uh, the law is Judy's third profession. She began in, in psychology. She then uh, went and spent 16 years in a very, very successful, and I'm sure known to many of you, career as a folk singer. She won various awards. Her songs, written songs, have been covered by many very well-known singers, and she, as a performer, was got the Mo Award for Australian Folk Performer of the Year. Then she moved to, and has, to my great regret, relinquished public singing performances <laughs> and became uh, a judge of the family court, and it's in that role that she'll speak to us. I felt a kind of um, subliminal parallel with everything that I heard. I began in, well, politics or philosophy. I had the ardent ambition to be a folk singer, and I sang a lot. My uh, success was not worldwide, but still, it was a career. I didn't go into the family court, but I did get divorced. So in many ways, <laughs> and I ended up in the law. Uh, so in many ways, we're really counterparts, but I'm less distinguished, and therefore I'll get off the stage, and Justice Judy Small will get on the stage. Thank you very much, Martin. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that we meet on Aboriginal land and to pay my respects to the elders of uh, the local people and to any other elders of Aboriginal tribes who might be here. I also want to say thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's, uh, when I saw the topic, I thought, but wait a minute, I'm not a criminal lawyer. I don't know anything about crime and punishment. What are they asking me to speak for? Um, and uh, so I'm speaking on whatever I like <laughs> today. And I speak very much in a personal capacity. Uh, I do not speak for the court. And the court, uh, while I am a family law judge, I'm actually a judge of the Federal Circuit Court, not the Family Court of Australia. And I say that uh, simply because I think the judges of the Family Court of Australia would complain if I didn't. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's strange for me to be here um, speaking at a forum on justice in my current capacity or, or having been invited in my current capacity as a judge because of course I've always spoken and sung about this stuff uh, for many many years and I've always been free to say whatever I like and to express my opinion about things like justice and uh, peace and all sorts of stuff like that Judges don't have political opinions that they express in public. And I have felt the limitation of that and uh, that lack of freedom quite, quite keenly in the only three years now since I've been a judge. But there is light at the end of that tunnel for me because judges have to retire at 70. We call that the age of statutory senility. <laughs> And uh, I will not be a judge forever. So one day I may again be able to speak and sing exactly what I want to say. Nevertheless, I will be saying some things today uh, about these issues. The other thing to say is that I'm not a criminal lawyer, so what do I know about crime and punishment? Very little. They say that criminal lawyers see bad people at their best while family lawyers see good people at their worst. And I think there's some very great truth in that. And I'll be talking a little bit um, more about uh, issues in family law and justice, very briefly, of course. <clears throat> but what I really want to talk about today, and of course I do have opinions uh, about issues like sentencing and prisons and all sorts of things uh, as a private citizen. But what I want to talk to you today is about advocacy. The 
uh, I was told that that's one of the topics that we were supposed, you know, that this forum was about. So I want to talk about advocacy and the values that underpin our advocacy. And anyone who is offended by the F word should leave now. Because I, for my whole life, in the past and will be forever, a proud feminist. Now, every time I say that, I always feel like I have to see, say, and this is what I mean by that. Being a feminist for me means that I am willing to work with any person of any gender, colour, nationality, creed, political persuasion, level of ability or economic status, who is willing to work with me to make this world a better place for women on the clear and certain understanding that if it is a better place for women, it will be a better place for everybody. That's what it means to me. If women feel safer walking the streets, everyone will feel safer walking the streets. If women are safer at home, everyone will feel safer at home, and so on. So that's the basis on which I base, on which I build um, my views and my values. I'm very interested when I'm talking about advocacy in the concept of power, because I, I was really uh, interested to hear what Deborah was saying about the state and the, the individual and the imbalance of power uh, between those two, and that's why we need ombudsmen's. I think we call them ombudsmen's. Ombudsmen. Yes. Um, or officers of the ombudsman. Because of that imbalance. Power is something that permeates, of course, everything we do. And what fascinates me is who has it, what do they do with it, and for whose benefit? And those questions have permeated my whole uh, my whole professional life. Psychology is certainly about that. It's about empowering people, helping people to understand the imbalances of power in their lives so that they can be empowered to live happier lives, I suppose. Certainly my music was about that. I don't expect any of you to have heard any of my music. Um, one thing I learned very quickly when I was uh, traveling the world as a folk singer is that you're only famous if people know who you are. <laughs> Think about that. Um, so I don't expect you to know, but a lot of my music was about power. It was about people coming up against uh, institutions and other people who had more power than they did and how we as a community uh, can deal with that issue. And certainly the law is about power. Uh, family law, as much as criminal law, is about power on a different plane, on a much more, uh, in some ways, confined, but in other ways, general uh, plane. I'll come back to that in a, in a moment. One thing I learned from my father is that words have power. When I was, uh, I learned that from my dad who was a journalist and uh, by pure <laughs> coincidence, given that we're talking about advocacy today, he was in my childhood the editor of a news, the local newspaper which was called the Coffs Harbour Advocate. So I learned about words and their power at a very early age. When I was at school, one of my school reports said, Judy excels in all aspects of oral work. <laughs> my father later told me that he thought that meant I talked too much. <laughs> and one of my teachers told my parents when I was about 11 that I would win a debate with Bob Menzies, um, for those of you who remember who he was. Language is an enormously powerful tool when we're talking about advocacy and we should never throw words about without thinking about what they mean, not only to us, but what they might mean to our audience and to the people we're advocating for. The other thing I learned from my parents in a small country town 
was that a commitment to community service and the principles of social justice, that is, looking out for others, or, as some might put it, loving your neighbour as yourself, forms the basis for a fulfilling and meaningful life. My mother, uh, when I was 12, I was given a, an autograph book for Christmas. You're not old enough to know what autograph books are, are you? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, and it was populated already with some quotes that, you know, with some writings. My father, in his inimitable fashion, wrote in my autograph book, in God we trust, all others please pay cash. <laughs> And my mother wrote a quote from C.J. Dennis's The Sentimental Bloke, and it said this, Life's what you make it, and he who tries to grab the shine and stars from out the skies grows crook on life and calls the world a cheat and tramples on the daisies at his feet. And that has stayed with me, as you can see. I didn't have to read that. That has stayed with me for more than 50 years that when we're talking about advocacy, we're talking about noticing the daisies and making sure that they bloom and making sure that when we are daisies, we don't let people trample on us. I must say that in the many years that I have seen myself as an advocate, and advocate comes from, the word advocate means speaking for, that's what, what the Latin root uh, comes from. When we speak for others, when we talk for others, when we give others a voice is what it really means, I've actually seen changes. Advoc advocacy could work. When I started my uh, work as a counsellor, uh, it was legal for a man to rape his wife. It was, legal, it was illegal to be homosexual. When I was very young, women had to leave the public service when they married. When my mother was a nurse, she had to leave nursing when she had her first child. We have seen an enormous change in the last 50 years in our culture and in our society. Advocacy works sometimes. It doesn't work all the time, and it doesn't work every time. But we need, it does work enough times to keep us going. And it needs to work enough times to keep us going, because when it doesn't work, it's heartbreaking. When we throw our lives into a cause uh, and into the work and the energy that we put in that is enormous. And then when nothing comes of it, or very little comes of it, it really does break our hearts. And I think Julian might talk a bit about that um, in a moment. But it doesn't mean we should stop because advocacy and speaking for others and the cause, whatever it is, is always worth it. When I uh, took uh, when I was appointed as a judge, I took an oath of office. And after the oath had said things like, yes, I'll well and truly serve the people of Australia, whatever, it then said, and I will do right to all manner of people according to law, without fear or favour, affection or ill will. I take that very seriously. And in family law, of course, when we're talking about advocacy and justice, we're not talking about institutions and the individual, we're talking about individuals and the individual. But of course, that doesn't mean that there is no power imbalance. <clears throat> Deborah said that the issues in prisons were things like drugs and alcohol and mental illness. They also, those issues, permeate the family law system. And the other issue, which particularly permeates the family law system, is family violence. When I was working uh, as a counsellor at the Rape Crisis Centre in Sydney in the 1970s, family violence was known as a domestic. And the police referred to it as, oh, it's just another domestic. 
things have changed enormously since then. And while there's still a long way to go, we shouldn't forget that uh, it was once legal uh, to rape one's wife and therefore uh, legal, in a sense, uh, to, uh, to beat one's wife as well. It was seen... I remember a judge of the family court, Sally Brown, who used to be the chief magistrate of this state, and she used to talk about a, a case in the uh, 80s when she was a magistrate where the defence counsel, uh, in a case of a man charged with assaulting his wife, said, oh, well, of course, Your Honour, it happened in the home. Um, it was a domestic assault, and as though that were a... a an uh, exculpatory uh, factor, and what Her Honour said to him was, thank you, Mr So-and-so, for pointing out that aggravating factor um, in this case. Nowadays, it is seen as an aggravating factor. But advocacy in my court, for me, is different, of course, than the people on the other side of the bar table. For them, it's advocating for their client. For me, advocacy is making sure, not so much speaking for people, but making sure that those who have a quieter or even silent voice in family law proceedings get heard. Those people particularly being uh, self-represented litigants, and can I say I distinguish unrepresented litigants from self-represented litigants, in family law because unrepresented litigants are those people who could have a lawyer, who can afford it, or who would be eligible for legal aid, but who choose to represent themselves. They're the ones I call unrepresented litigants. Self-represented litigants are those who simply can't afford um, a lawyer and don't, don't qualify for legal aid and who must represent themselves. Those people have a very quiet voice in the family law system, and I see my role uh, in the family law system is to make sure that they get heard. I always say to them, it must feel a bit like you're in a movie where everybody knows the script but you. And they nod. It's exactly what it's like. So my job is to help them with the script, to teach them when to come in and when to leave to teach them or guide them as to when they say their lines and how they say them. Not what they say, but uh, the process of how that goes. The other people who need advocacy in the court are people with a disability, a serious disability, whether physical, psychiatric, or as a result of emotional trauma from family violence. Those people need advocacy too. It is heartbreaking for me to see a woman who is the victim of family violence, or better said, a survivor of family violence, to see that woman being cross-examined by the perpetrator because we have no uh, way at that moment of stopping that happening, we can put her in a separate uh, place and have her give her evidence by video, but that's about the best we can do. There is a move, of course, to uh, change that so that women in that position will get representation. So all of those people need protection but, and advocacy. Uh, but the ones who need it most in the family law system, of course, are children. Children about whom much of family law is. And they need uh, protection and they need to have their voices heard and I am proud to say that in the family law system, their voices do get heard, either through an independent children's lawyer or through uh, a family consultant who meets with the family and gives the court uh, the views of the children. Uh, <coughs> Martin and uh, Julian both asked me if I was going to sing today, <coughs> and I said no, um, because I don't anymore. But uh, I think music is one of the... Uh, well, let's put it this way. There has never been a political cause or an activist cause which hasn't had music that goes with it. Never. Think about that. There is music in everything that we do as advocates, and I would urge you both to speak and to sing out for justice. Well done, Judy.